Kenya's Supreme Court today upheld Uhuru Kenyatta's presidential election victory. The White House issued a statement this afternoon congratulating Kenya's president on that victory. Meanwhile, Africa is the world's fastest growing continent and it is changing dramatically. A recent special report in The Economist notes Never in the half century since it won independence from the colonial powers has Africa been in such good shape. Its economy is flourishing. Most countries are at peace. Ever fewer children bear arms and record numbers go to school. Mobile phones are as ubiquitous as they are in India. And in the worst affected countries, HIV infections have fallen by up to three quarters. President Obama Thursday met with leaders of four small African nations, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Malawi, and Cape Verde. They talked about their emerging democracies and America's interests on the continent as well. Whitney Schneidman is a non-resident fellow at the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution. And our friend Rohit Kantru has been in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa for us uh, for some time now. And it's good to see you, uh, both of you. Whitney, let me start with you. The countries visiting with President Obama were not the economic heavyweights of the region, but they are solid democracies. What's the American interest in Africa right now, and how has it changed? Well, the American interest in Africa right now is in democracy, it's in economic development, and it's in commercial opportunity. Uh, what we're seeing on the continent is the emergence of, of a middle class across the continent, some 350 million people who are buying televisions, buying cell phones, buying cars. And this is the new Africa. And this increasingly is going to be the story coming out of the continent uh, for the next 10 years. So the visit to the White House on Thursday by the four leaders is recognition not only of the do, uh, new democracy, but of the new opportunity that's uh, emerging on the continent. Robert, let's, let's talk about the democracy there. Democratic governments are, are on the rise throughout Africa, according to The Economist. Uh, now there are at least 25 that's up from just three at the end of the Cold War. And many more African nations are holding elections as well. What does democracy look like? on the continent in, in broad terms? It's a, it's a very important question. First of all, it's important to realize that the, ma the vast majority of Africans live under democratically elected governments. Now, these aren't usually Jeffersonian democracies as most Americans recognize them, but these are governments that by and large reflect the will of the people. And as we saw in Kenya over the last several days and today, sometimes it gets very complicated. Uh, where Uhuru Kenyatta, his election was just confirmed. He's been indicted by the ICC. But his election reflects the will of the Kenyan people. So I think that presents a challenge to the United States to deal with these emerging democracies that aren't perfect democracies, but they're on the way to being representative government that uh, includes more transparency, more accountability, and creates more opportunity for the people that are being governed. Rohit, you're on the ground there uh, in South Africa. Talk to me just in terms of just in, empirically what you've seen in terms of this, this evolution on the continent, you know, two or three years ago versus, you know, when you were there uh, until now. A rapid evolution uh, here in South Africa and in countries right across um, this continent. Um, I was in uh, uh, Addis Ababa recently, the capital of Ethiopia, and you see a huge skyline springing up right in front of you. This was the heart of the famine of a few decades ago, and yet here we were looking at this incredible skyline that really was a symbol of rapid economic progress, much of that fueled um, by the, the rapid growth of the cell phone, particularly more than anything else. For, uh, for every four people in Africa, there are three cell phones, and people are using them to swap money. It's now become their bank, as well as their way of getting information from outside of their own uh, countries. But, you know, there is a challenge for the United States, and that comes from China, um, which is behind a great deal of investment in this continent, yeah. um, road development, stadia, all over this place. Um, and the question really for many African leaders is, do we want to accept investment from 
the United States or from China. Now, China have, over the last few years, seemed so much more keen than the United States, European countries and others. And the perception here, uh, right or wrong, is that that can be done as a no-strings-attached investment. We can take Chinese money, uh, billions of dollars worth of it in every single country uh, across this continent, um, and we won't be lectured about our human rights records, about the quality of our democracy. Huh. That is certainly the perception uh, right across this continent. And the question for the United States is, do they challenge that somehow, um, or do they stick to their own course as it is now? Whitney, I'm going to end with you. I want you to pick up that question that Rohit just asked there, uh, because as he noted, China has become the continent's largest trading partner, $11 billion a year at one point, and now it's, I believe, 166 or close to $170 billion. Is the Chinese, is the Chinese interest in Africa, is it purely an economic one? Well, um, uh, first of all, I guess I would challenge one aspect of uh, Rohek's very uh, uh, insightful comments and, and say it's not either or. It's not either China or uh, the U.S. China does have a capability to make loans available, make investment decisions much more quickly. Look, China is not a democracy, so many of these firms are not accountable to shareholders, so they can make decisions a lot a lot more quickly. But um, uh, many African leaders are very keen to see U.S. companies out there because American companies have a tradition not only of being good partners, but they train workers, they transfer skills, they create s uh, supply chains that are connected to the global economy. And many Africans are in love with American brands. The challenge for the United States is why why aren't more companies investing? And I think this is an interesting dynamic. Here, the president of China, President Xi, yeah. on his first trip, is visiting Tanzania, South Africa, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And President Obama, in four years plus now, has spent less than 24 hours on the continent. So how do we, I think the question for us is, how do we energize our commercial engagement on the continent? We are going to have to leave it there this time around. Whitney Schneidman from the Brookings institution, uh, Rohit Kanchru, our man on the ground there in South Africa. Uh, Rohit, especially good to see you, sir. Thank you for all your hard work. Whitney, good to see you as well. Have a great Thank Easter, you. guys.